Faces and Places. Excited to have you guys here because it is our second to last lecture. So we have an amazing um, lineup for today. Kim Nemzer, uh, Chief Merchandising Officer from Warby Parker is joining us. Uh, just a couple quick announcements before we jump in with Kim. Um, as you all know by now, lecture prep questions are due blank before class, um, and there's only one lecture left after today. So um, hopefully if you haven't done it yet, you have one for today and you're ready to go for next week as well. Um, but I would also ask all of you to go on and check your grades uh, today and make sure that everything looks okay for lecture prep questions, which I usually hand, you know, gather in person. So I want to make sure that I'm catching everyone that has sent one via email. And um, take, take a look at your attendance, make sure that looks kosher, and take a look at any other grades and just let me know if you have questions in advance of next week because I don't want you to have a surprise uh, in the final week of class. At the end of lecture today, there will be an attendance question as usual. Please make sure to email me for full credit for attending today. And just so you're all aware, as you're starting to look at your attendance, if, I, if for whatever reason I do not have an attendance answer from you from a certain day, that is a late um, absence. You're marked as late, I should say, which is really leaving early. Um, so you should just be aware that that would be what you would be docked for on your attendance when you're taking a look. Any questions? Okay. I do have a quick one. Sure. Um, hello, Professor. How are you? Thank you. Hi. <laughs> um, this okay so we have uh kim nemser today and there's the panel yes and then the final class there's no class there's no class it's a final exam home. which is the take home mm -hmm. and you will have the week before class to complete it so it will be um it'll go live right after the panel on the 14th okay got it oh okay oh okay so too bad because we could have asked them all those questions that are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> what, do, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. well, I, I think if we don't know by now, it's, uh, yeah, I think that most of everything has been covered, really. It's been very um, insightful. But okay, thank you. I will, um, I'll turn off my mic. Perfect. Yes, yeah, so as we just covered, we have Kim today. Next week, Fashion Service Network will be joining us with a group of panelists. Um, I'm still waiting to hear what the final roster is, but usually it is a great smattering of people from um, financing to marketing to recruiting, and we um, tackle the topic of how to build your own career path after everything you've learned this semester to kind of think about yourselves and building your um, your own path and your own brand and making, making yourself uh, put the best foot forward as you step out into the real world. Uh, last flash of the remote guidelines, just make sure to use raise your hand button uh, if you want to speak and I'll call on you in order. If you have an immediate or pressing question, please type it in the chat function. If you're speaking, please turn your camera on. And if you raise your hand, preemptively turn your camera on. Uh, you guys have no idea how nice it is when you're kind of staring at all these black bubbles of names to see actual faces. So. It's very important that you do that if you can, if your um, connection allows. And then only unmute when you begin to speak. Any questions before we move forward? All right. Well, I'm super excited to introduce you guys to Kim Nemzer. She's the Chief Merchandising Officer at Warby Parker. Um, a, it's a transformative lifestyle brand that offers designer eyewear at a revolutionary price while leading the way for socially conscious businesses. She leads merchandising, planning, product development, and strategy for the business. Kim started her career in finance, working as an analyst for UBS Investment Bank, and then moved to BAAM, BAM, the hedge fund arm of the Blackstone Group. After four years in finance, Kim pivoted to work in the fashion industry, where she worked for two years at Todd's, an Italian leather goods company. From Todd, she moved to J. Crew and spent seven years working in women's merchandising, most recently as vice president overseeing the women's footwear and accessories businesses. A native, a native of Falmouth, Maine, Kim graduated from Dartmouth College. She sits on the board of the luxury DTC footwear brand, direct to consumer footwear brand, Sarah Flint, and is also part of the Memorial Sloan Kettering's Associates Committee and Good Plus Foundation's Friends Committee. Kim lives in Greenwich Village with her husband, Adam, and their two children, Millie and Hayes. Thank you for joining us, Kim. 
Hello, I just want to make sure you guys can hear me okay. I did like the little test, yes. but okay, excellent. Oh, I'm so Hi. excited and thrilled to be here. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Yes, we can see you and hear you perfectly. So great. <laughs> um, so I just I'd love to start with just getting a little bit more color around your background and your career path. Yeah, so I, I would love some of the questions that you sent me because obviously when you hear a little bit about my background, it's a bit unusual um, and really out of college. The most important thing at the time for me at 22 is I wanted to be in New York City. I was very intrigued by being in this city. And I think one of the things I knew at that age is there was a lot I didn't know about kind of what job opportunities looked like and even job descriptions. I think, you know, 18, 19 years ago, there's a lot of jobs that weren't even in existence at that stage. And you, it was a little bit more, you do this or you do this or you go into this industry. So, um, in, in getting here, um, one of the things working in finance, I quickly realized, A, it wasn't my passion. I didn't want to be there long term, but I might as well learn a little bit about business. So I figured that would really help me along the way. And then as I began to dive deeper into um, some of the different sectors within finance, the consumer industry was the most interesting to me. So I found myself reading up on different businesses, consumer psychology, what the trends looked like. And that kind of just made me realize very quickly, I'd rather read, you know, at the time, WWD than the financial Financial times. And so then I set on this path of like, how do I get myself from here to there? I did a bunch of research and kind of met everyone that I could in the industry and kind of took, I would say, like a bit of a chance at four years into my career. But a good friend of mine was working at Todd's and she said, you know more about this business than I do. So if you're willing to kind of you know, take a pay cut and start over again, this might be the way to get you on. So that was kind of how I made it to Todd's. And it was an interesting transition for a lot of reasons, but I think the thing I was most excited is I love product. I love kind of the tangible feeling of product and, and really being able to sort of merge, especially in my job now, this idea of, of art and design, but also of math and science, kind of knowing what the customer wants. In this day and age too, we have access to so much data and so much analytics. So I say more than ever, we can make that educated gut. We can pull from the analytics, we can pull from what our customers want, but still we have to decide whether green or yellow is going to be the color of the season, right? So to me, that's sort of the, the magic behind my job these days is I, I ha can pull from my financial background and the understanding of the business metrics, but there's still a lot of the design and development, consumer engagement and creative elements that go into it. That's great. I am. Um, I Professor, you froze. I know. I was going to say I lost her. Uh, okay. Looks like you're back. Me then. It looks like you faded out, but it was me. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I don't know where I cut out, but I was just saying that I love that you get to use both sides of your brain in the in the buying merchandising sales world. Um, me too. And essentially, so moving from Todd's to uh, J. Crew was really interesting because of merchandising at J. Crew, and obviously that business has gone through a lot in the five years since I've been gone. But one of the things I really loved is that merchants got to own their business. So you really you had a grasp of the open to buy, really how many receipts were coming in, where you were were you sending them to stores, were you keeping them for online? But you were also lockstep with design. It's been really fun to see Jenna Lyons launch her new show because she and I worked so closely together for so many years, really picking the color palette, understanding what businesses we wanted to pick. It too. So J. Crew especially really allowed merchants to have, you know, a say in the product and the trends, but also run the business, which is a, a really nice merger. Yeah, that's great. How did you get that first job out of Todd's? I know you mentioned your friend there. Yes. And so and then I, I pretty quickly realized at Todd's it was um, a very old school Italian male run company that perhaps what I wanted maybe wasn't going to exactly drive with what the company's sort of history and tradition where I was not a male, I didn't live in Italy, and we were definitely like a, a, a satellite office to some degree. I also, it was more on the wholesale side of things, and I really wanted to own the product. So I kind of made the list of 10 companies that were really intriguing to me. Where did I shop? Where did I relate to the product? And then started to do a lot of research. Did I know anyone? Did I know anyone who knew someone who knew someone who might? And J. Crew was at the top of the list, and I had a good friend of my husband's whose wife worked there. So I started picking her brain and, and applied. And when I applied, I was not the typical candidate because I'd had so much experience kind of in finance and then more on the luxury side of things. And J. Cruz much more of, um, was in that like more fast retailing type space. But one of the interesting things is at the time when you interviewed at, at 
J. Crew, Mickey Drexler interviewed every single candidate that came through the door. <laughs> and so I sort of realized, okay, this is my chance and I can just convince him that I love product and then I'll work super hard and that I have a point of view on the business and perhaps kind of some of the things that I thought they could do better as a consumer and I might be able to convince him and, and I did and he's actually my mentor to this day. So, oh, that's um, great. yeah, that was a really pivotal move in my career, that move from Todd's to J. Crew, And yeah. that was just a crazy time because then this was now 12 years ago, J. Crew was kind of skyrocketing. They're really sort of at that time defining sort of what it meant to be like an American, you know, American fashion company, but still attainable, kind of still on high street, but also setting some trends. So it was a, a fun time to be there for sure. Yeah, that's great. Um, Tell us about your college experience. Was there anything that, you know, anything you did there that set you up for success that you would recommend? To a so, it, I mean, as I said, when I was in college, I didn't even know that the job I have now existed, if that makes any sense. So I went to a liberal arts <laughs> That's school. That's what happened to me. Um, yeah. senior year of college, I'm like, that's a job? <laughs> what? I want that. I didn't know that was even a thing. I can take product and tell people what to buy. That sounds awesome. But so I took a much more traditional college route. But I would say what I took from, from Dartmouth was a small liberal arts college in New Hampshire. So A, it made me really want to move to New York City. But more importantly, the social aspect of it, I think, was really important. Learning to stick out my hand and introduce myself. I went to college not knowing anybody. So kind of understanding how that worked and what I don't even think I knew what it was called, but networking, asking a lot of questions, being really curious. Where do you come from? What it, I think those were skills that, it, you know, growing up in a small town in Maine, I didn't have to really think about or hone in on as much. I would also say the other thing more than anything is writing. I'm an English major. I don't use much of that other than I learned to write. And I think no matter what you do in business, if you have the ability to translate what you think, what your ideas are into a cohesive and concise, you know, um, whether it's a presentation, an email, whatever it may be, it's really, really important. And I often find when I'm interviewing people, I'm as interested in how they how they present themselves in their resume or in their cover letter, because I think that also speaks to, you know, the writing skills. And, and in my world, we present a lot. And so also just the presentation skills, figuring out in these smaller classrooms how to get up in front of people. And this was before kind of virtual and PowerPoint and presentation. So it was a little bit more just reliant on your public speaking skills. Those are things that I still use to this day. I think you'd also ask me, is there something I would have done differently? I probably would have taken more um, sort of business classes, like econ classes, just because I, I feel like I was learning on the spot, which is great because I really learned relevant to the jobs. But there was probably some core things that knowing that I was there for four years, I could have focused a little bit more in that world. Yeah, that's great. I love your answers. And I, I'm on week 13 of this semester, but this is my, you know, I've been teaching this class for a long time. And I, I haven't heard anyone actually say what you said, but I love the fact that you're, you're honing on both networking, but also writing, because that's one of my focuses in this course is just thinking about the business and talking about the business thoughtfully and intelligently and cohesively. Um, there's no real right or wrong answers. There's just thought that needs to go into things and and putting it down and doing it in the right way, which I think is super important. So I manage, manage a team of 30 right now. And one of the, the workshops that I'm having them go through next week is actually how to take all of this information and prepare it and present it back in a way that people can actually understand and, and really honing in on what are the three things that you hope people take away from that? And how quickly can you get those out? Because I think I have two types of people on my team, some that just present me pages and pages and pages of emails and data, and they get everything out there. And it's great, but I often don't have the time to go through it. And the others that are so bulleted that they leave out kind Kind of the main point so just like it, it really is a skill that I'm still continuing to, to innovate on and that, that and I say writing and writing has many forms today but presentation skills in general it's really if you're trying to build a business if you're trying to present yourself right like that thing that we've all heard what's your 20 second pitch when you talk about what you do or who you are those things are really important because sometimes it's those conversations that really change the whole direction totally that's great uh, what's the most creative part of your job so, I mean, working with frames, so I oversee the design and development piece of things. And one of the most fun is actually um, what glasses are made of. I actually brought some because I think it's oh, easier. <laughs> yeah. But like, um, sorry for the awkward reach over. But 
if you can kind of see there's acetate is the main type of um, material that most of our glasses are made from. I'm really bad at showing the camera. But so we actually design all of our acetate. So we fly to, we go over to Italy and it's right outside of Venice twice a year. Actually think about from a graphic image, like how do we want this tortoise to look if we want to yeah. play with striation? So like right now green, we cannot keep green on the shelves. It is the color of 2020. I don't know if it's <laughs> green means prosperity or hope or last year it was yellow and yellow doesn't even you know yellow is not a color that typically sells but people want to see yellow and it's actually we see it as an indicator of forced happiness people are trying to feel happy so they associate yellow with the sunshine and brightness and are looking for light yeah. and that kind of thing but so we spend a lot of time on color trends and and how to develop those and then also a lot on fit like how glasses actually fit so we work a lot with the product which for me is really really exciting the other piece is how do we present our brand like what is the messaging of our brand to consumers so a lot of time on imagery what type of models we use how we want who we hope that our brand is speaking to and especially over this last year really thinking about inclusivity and understanding how the messaging gets out there and how we want to be presented and perceived as a brand that's like the fun creative stuff for me oh, that's great um, and what do you find to be the most is that the most fulfilling part of your job or is there anything else that <laughs> For me, as my career has evolved, it's it's really being a leader and, and a manager. So being in the leadership team of Warby Parker, we've now grown. I mean, when I started five years ago, we had 12 stores. We now have 140. We have over 3,000 employees. You know, there was less than a couple, we had a couple hundred when I started. So being part of that and, and kind of helping to guide that ship in that direction, knowing how influential Warby Parker has been, both from a branding perspective, but also from a give back, the philanthropic, the philanthropic elements that we incorporate, I think have been we've been a leader in that sense that's been but then also just my team i have 29 people and on my team and during COVID especially you realize how much your team is an extension of your family you see them as much or more than your family sometimes and you're with them all the time so figuring out how to connect with them and see them continue to grow and evolve and develop in their career paths even virtually has this year has been very strange but also strangely fulfilling in that sense yeah that's great you know i i I feel like I skipped over a little bit about what Warby Parker is about. I, yeah. I think that if you are a young fashion student, you probably know lots about Warby Parker because it is such, I feel like it's such a talked about great model of um, an online business that has grown to 140 retail locations. <laughs> but, but do you want to, do you want to talk a little bit about the company yeah. and the culture and things like that? Absolutely. So we're, we hit our, we had our 10 year our 10th birthday, I guess, in February oh, of this wow. year, which is kind of crazy that we're, I think people see us as a startup, but now we, we've hit a decade, you know, we're double yeah. digits, as my, as my daughter would say. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we really started, when we started this, it was actually for business school students, and they really thought about what industry could, you know, at the time the word disrupt was pretty ubiquitous, but what industry hasn't been changed or rethought in a long time? And the glasses industry kind of came to the forefront because it was really tied to these small optical shops and you kind of went in there and all the glasses were behind um, a glass case and you kind of didn't know how much what the value of, of glasses were it was very much in the doctor or the shop owner's hands versus the customer's hands so kind of the idea was how do we flip that and give the customer the choice to pick out glasses that are not only affordable but take out that middleman that additional markup that the customers paying and sell directly to the consumers but then also built within kind of the absolute fabric of the company was this idea of giving back like in this day and age the consumer wants transparency they want access to what the brand ethos is and where they come from. And so how, how do we then combine this idea with the idea of also providing vision care to those most in need around the world? And so it was that, that was kind of the initial evolution, but also just affordable eyewear that was still fashionable and still cool. And we could still build a brand at a price point that was attainable without you know having to sort of compromise on either side of it. So, I mean, our glasses are made in, in the same as anyone from Ray-Ban to Prada to Gucci, you name it. I'm in all the factories, all of them. But because we're going direct to the factories and we're selling that product directly to the customer, we have the ability to really come in at a, at a much more, um, I think, value-driven price. But we also spent a lot of time on the brand. What does that brand mean? And I think we tried to, you know, at the time, millennial was a word that was, you know, very, um, out there in the ethos, but just we wanted younger people to think glasses were fun and cool, and it didn't necessarily have to be kind of in this category of here of over 50 with like bifocals and only through your eye doctor. So it's been a fun lesson in kind of branding and the power of kind of how your consumer views you is very much how you can sort of evolve a brand. So it's been fun in that sense, and, and Warby Parker's grown like crazy, um, yeah. but 
in terms of working there, it's the most fun place I've ever worked. It's a very open kind of business school type culture of, you know, I would say like probably modeled after the Googles and Facebooks of the world. It's very open office, hence we're closed because we're not at all COVID friendly. Everyone, <laughs> there's no walls, there's no doors. There's, But I think it's this idea of accountability, love for the brand, passion for the brand. And at the time, you know, five or six years ago, it was pretty small. So people were rolling up their sleeves and doing a lot of different things, which I think gets you a buy. And we have really long tenure of employees um, and our two CEOs, are very visible. I mean, we have like, for example, one of the things I think is so interesting having worked at many other places is every week we have a town hall and they stand up on a stage or now they, they make a recording and just say, here's what the business did this week. Here's what's going on. Here are the key decisions we're making. Here's what we think you should be focusing on. And I say to my team who's only ever worked at Warby, you don't know how unique that is because I've worked at places where it was very opaque and you kind of put your head down and you did your job. So it's it's been really interesting for me to to convey to the team how how much of a privilege it is to work somewhere where you have every you know piece of understanding of how this business works and what the priorities and focuses are. That's great. Sorry, I just cut out again. Let me just I'm just gonna check something. I'm not sure no, why I'm no worries. <laughs> Hi Kim, quick question. Well well Hi. The professor is off. So I watched this TED talk and it was about procrastination and the okay. hello there on the ted talk was um because i'm a procrastinator and, um, <laughs> all of us all of us have that tendency you know <laughs> what is this problem and quickly so the, he he gave this analogy this story about how he was asked by two college friends to get in on a startup business and um they were procrastinating, procrastinating, procrastinating. And like weeks before the launch, quote unquote, they still hadn't had the T's crossed and the I's dotted. And he pulled out. Um, and because they were just, you know, procrastinating and being lazy and in his mind, whatever. And of course, it turned out to be Warby Parker. Is that true? <laughs> You know, I don't know that story because the four founders I'm very close with have known them for a long time. I've never heard of the mysterious fifth, um, <laughs> but I'll have to ask. I would love to know that because I was like, well, I procrastinate, so. Yeah, I mean, they, uh, I mean, I think they would tell you they're business school students. And, you know, when they first pitched this idea, their professor, Adam Grant, who actually is a really awesome author who writes a lot about opportunity costs and um, would be just a good book to read in general. He he talks about how he said in one of his books, I didn't think they could do it. I didn't think they could pull this off. This didn't seem like a, an industry that needed disrupting. I didn't believe people would ever buy glasses online. And so we sell his, the book is called Originals and we sell it in our stores because we love that he was like, you guys were totally right. This is a great idea. And I just, I couldn't envision something that that was that forward thinking. So, but I, I don't know about this fifth member, but I'll do some research and find out. <laughs> Great, sorry, hopefully hopefully it's a little better now. Um, so how, what, what is a typical day or week like for you as CMO? Probably yeah, so COVID is more interesting than post. <laughs> exactly, I'll give you pre and, pre and post. So um, at Warby is interesting because as the CMO, I oversees our merchandising arm, which is really, we're responsible for the selection of, of product and really the life cycle of the product. So we look, we're looking 18 months into the future. So right now we're actually buying fall, we're, we've already bought fall 2021 and we're designing spring 2022. So it's kind of how far in advance the cycle is. So merchants are really responsible for what's working right now and how is that applying to the future? And then my product development arm is really like, what does our vendor portfolio look like? Where are we sourcing things? Like we have a lot of exposure to China. So I've spent a lot of time understanding, is there ways would we ever bring like manufacturing to the United States? Could we afford that? Is there is there a demand for that here? What would that look like? We, we also manufacture a lot in Italy. So looking at that portfolio and understanding understanding sample costs, opportunity costs. We may, I also manage a team of five in China, so understanding kind of quality and process and what that looks like. And then the last the last team that I manage is our planning and, and allocation team. So what does our five-year forecast look like? What does our forecast in December look like? Can we hit that forecast? What will it take to hit that? So I kind of have this, those are sort of the three tiers, but really I joke, Warby Parker is very meeting centric. So I could literally jump from a spring 2022 design um, 
presentation where they're telling me all the things that they're excited about and then jump to 2021 planning by headcount and then jump to looking at all the emails for the next four weeks and do I like the copy associated with them? Do the images match back to kind of the trends that we're seeing? And then the last one might be, you know, planning a virtual end of year offsite for my team. There's 30 of us. So what are the workshops that I want people to be working and how do I assign those kind of things? So it's really, I think what I like given my personality is that it's all over the place and I have to turn different parts of my brain on at any given time, but it's mostly all directly related to our product, our business strategy and kind of how we're look, taking what we're learning now and applying it to the future. I think one of the interesting things Warby does really well is you're managing the business now, but we're always thinking three years ahead because even last year isn't really pertained to our business anymore because we've opened 50 stores and COVID has happened. And so the rapid changing and scaling also forces you to really think to the future. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So how has COVID kind of changed? <laughs> COVID is this much Forever. more in the reaction seat and, and the proactive seat, I would say. The biggest thing was really out of the gates was how do we shift? You know, we closed a lot of our retail stores. So we were constantly figuring out what our, our retail field looked like and how long could we afford to pay our retail associates? When would we have to close them down? Was it going to be a swift closure across the country? Was it going to be based on geo? Was it based on case percentage? Or, you know, so there was a lot of that just really reacting to the state of the world, the constant evolving and changing nature of the information we were getting and how that was impacting our employees. So that was kind of like stage one it was like, excuse my language, but oh shit. Okay. What are we going to do now? And who do we have to make sure that we're taking care of? But really it was, it was great. We, the, our senior leadership team came together and said the first and most important thing is like, we have to take care of our employees. We have to make sure everybody is in a safe space, has access to what they need to do their job and has a, you know, a communication line that is completely open from a resource perspective, emotional well-being, financial well-being, all of that. So that was really actually as stressful as it was and kind of around the clock, it was really heartwarming to be at a company where that was the most important thing more than anything else. It's like, we have to take care of our, our people and our team. And then it was, and then it was a lot of moving parts of if we're closing down the retail stores, where is that inventory going to go? How do we get it to our distribution centers to fulfill our online orders? Because our retail business went down, but our online business is shot through the roof over the last six months. I joke that this has become really expensive real estate and we happen yeah. to fall in that square, in that rectangle. So when you think of beauty products, hair products, eyewear, jewelry, earrings, hair accessories, those have all seen a massive uptick of the last six yeah. months, but it's because that's, I could have, you know, shorts on under here. No one can tell. Right? Like, so totally. we, we kind of fall that's into funny. this as becoming an accessory. And so even we, we started selling blue light glasses. So you don't even need a prescription, but it helps protect against the blue light from your computer. Those went through the roof. And I said, this is like a COVID mask. People like to wear their big chunky glasses, make their statement in a way that maybe they can't make it um, virtually. So that was another interesting thing is to see and, and be able to really look at just the e-com channel or e-commerce channel and under understand the trends of that business and parse it apart for retail. So kind of reacting and then what are we learning? And, and because of what we're learning, what are we going to do to change things? And then the last was just inventory. How do we push things out, beg our vendors to hold things a little bit longer while we figured out where to go? Um, so those were the, the main things. And then just, I, you know, getting used to this, I think my job is a very in-person job. I travel a lot normally um, between Europe and Singapore and China, and then also domestically. So to be completely grounded, which was amazing from being with my children perspective, but also learning how to get all of this done via the computer was a, a, a steep learning curve as well. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Um, are all of your stores reopened? They are all reopened right now. Yep. So they we started reopening in July and then now it's just a constant what constant watch game of what's going on yeah. in what different regions and what are we seeing? Obviously California, we're seeing a lot of things going on there. So determining, you know, what that looks like from a store closure perspective. But it's our head of retail, I don't envy her. She has had a tough year. <laughs> Now, your previous head of retail, I was quarantined with my first three, the first three months of quarantine. And that's how, that's oh, how we were connected with Kyle. Okay, yes, with Kyle. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yes. <laughs> and, I, and he was on his way to move to California. Um, we had the twins uh, right out of the, oh, my God, the twins at the outset. Yes. I was like, oh, they my had, gosh. And they had COVID. Both he and his wife had COVID yes. when they had the twins. First case in the country to give birth to twins positive for COVID. <laughs> Claim to fame, but anyway, <laughs> fame. <laughs> but anyway, he he uh, he echoed a lot of this, and it was really interesting hearing his perspective, you know, on how 
how Warby was handling his, his your yeah. employees at the time. And it was, it was really impressive to hear. Um, who's the most impressive or most interesting person or impressive person you've met throughout your career? I would say working for Mickey Drexler definitely changed me. Um, and just in, in, a, in a great way, he was a really intense man to work for, but he had such passion for product and he, and he taught the people that worked closest with him how to stand up for what they believed in, to be super decisive, to make sure that you knew what you were speaking about, to be super factual. And he's just continued to be, he sits on the board of Warby Parker, so I'm in touch with him a lot still. And he's just been um, super influential in, in my career personally and sort of pushing me to, to step outside of the boundaries. He gave me a lot of opportunities really quickly at J. Crew and kind of saw how excited and passionate what I was about the business. So um, that was really fun. And then also last year, we um, did an amazing collaboration with Jimmy Fallon. So I got to work with him quite a bit mm -hmm. to develop these um, glasses that we called Jimmy's Spinnies. And he was just really fun. He was just a really fun collaborator. But to get to be in his office and kind of see how his mind works. And then when we were we got to go to the show and see him kind of, he gifted everyone the show and he announced the collaboration that was just a really fun such a different industry but to see how excited he was about our product and how much he cared but also completely trusted us to to do what he wanted was that was a really neat collaboration oh that's great yeah he strikes me as someone who hasn't changed too much in stardom but no he, he's very much himself he's all over the place he walked right. in and he's like you want popcorn he's ca he's calling his wife on speakerphone he's like all over the place but you, you it was fun to get to see him in his element for sure yeah oh, he was great. so such a fan of the brand which was also you know for us a huge compliment yeah no um and, and in your bio it seems that you've always been in either accessories or footwear is that correct Yes, and then at J. Crew, I also oversaw women's wear, but also, oh. but started with footwear and accessories, and then also got, got, got to it. kind of co lead women's exactly. But oh, started what, what in Todd with bags and shoes. Oh, yeah. I love accessories and footwear. I actually, you know, handbags, accessories, footwear, even more so than clothing. I think part of it, well, for me, accessories and handbags, there's no size. So every, you don't have to worry about the sizing element from a buying perspective, but also it's every, it's there, everyone can have any of it and can wear any of it. and, and that's to me the the accessibility of it. I really I appreciated and loved. Um, I also used to joke, you know, I could justify the cost per wear metric that I always used to say to my merchants is like, someone if you're buying a handbag, you're wearing it every day. So like we could we can really you know purchase the most beautiful materials and that kind of thing because it becomes part of their style versus a shirt or blouse that you're kind of in and out of all the time. So and the most fun was um, I was there when we launched J. Crew Jewelry and that was amazing because we grew the business from like three million to 60 million in a year and we were kind of the original like attainable statement necklace, the bubble necklace. We sold like a million yeah. of them in a year and going after a business like that. I mean, we would sit in Jenna's office and just put all these things on the table and piece these necklaces together and went yeah. from buying like 10,000 units to 250,000 units. And so that was a, a really fun, exciting thing to kind of see take off. And then I would joke, we would see them in the wild when I would like be on the subway and someone would be wearing the necklace or wearing the earrings. You'd get very excited. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, how do you feel like how do you feel like women's wear differs from footwear and accessories? I mean, you mentioned the sizing difference. Yeah, si from a merchant's perspective, I think the key is sizing. There's also just footwear. I think is a little bit the trend cycle is longer, and accessories the trend cycle is shorter. So I think it's like belts might be in one season and out the next. Statement earrings, then to tiny gold jewelry, then to so you really have to figure out how to buy and be ready to transition quickly. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a big one. And footwear has a really long lead time. So you really have to be sure of what you're buying because it takes a long time to get back into something. So the risk there, you have to have a little bit of an appetite for trend and risk and that piece of things. Clothing, especially um, when I was at J. Crew, is the same. I mean, it's there's a, an element that the consumer cares a little bit less. There's like always a key item, but there's just a lot of things that like what we actually what kept the lights on versus what we were excited about were two very different things. Like really the knit t-shirts and the classic cable sweater are what the customer perceives as, you know, the DNA of your brand. But what the designers and the merchants are excited about are the sequin sweatpants or that crazy leopard print. So kind of balancing of like, what is like actually exciting and then what will actually drive margin dollars. So finding the balance between those two and what consumers, I think too, especially now, 
the business has changed so much where I think consumers want to look to a brand for something versus everything. Like five or six years ago, people wanted to look to a J. Crew and say, I want that look head to toe. Now they like this idea that I go here for my sweaters, I go here for my shoes. This brand represents like best in class here. So there's not nearly the brand loyalty. I think it's also women's wear is a hard business right now. I also think there's like a lot less the the fast fashion and cheap fashion has really I mean even in the last five or six years the Zara's and H and M's have kind of overtaken that middle tier which was hard and we were just seeing the beginning of that when I was leaving J Crew. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, well this year has been very interesting because even like recently oh. I've had the bug to go buy things and I've gone and bought them and then I realized no one sees them because I'm yeah. wearing my coat all the time. <laughs> it's the only time I'm out of the house I'm wearing the coat and if I'm in the house. Maybe someone will see it over Zoom, but. <laughs> yeah. So, well, coats, so interesting, J. Crew like coats was a huge business, but it was such a finite time period, right? So you really had to get it right. And the question would be like, do we bring the coats out in August or September? Do we mark them down before Christmas? We don't be stuck with too much inventory. Or, so those, those very seasonal businesses are really, really fun, but really hard to predict. Same with swimwear. When do you put swimwear out into the market? When do you mark it down? How long do you keep it at full price? I'm sorry. I keep cutting out again. I'm not really sure why, but. Don't worry. Just, I tried plugging myself into the inter, uh, power. Maybe that. <laughs> um, I had a very weird realization this week about the Christmas tree that no one outside of my immediate family, other than mm -hmm. my babysitter, <laughs> is going to see this. The tree. I know it is crazy to think about all those things that you just take for granted this year. Hi. Is there um, a, a, a member uh, a connection to the Jexer Lambert um, investment people? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of that question. Mickey Drexler, that you he has with? his own Drex. He has Drexler Venture Fund, so that's his own thing. He's not. I don't think he's part of the Lambert. One, but he has his own kind of venture capital where he invests in um, different retail companies and just sort of invests his own capital. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. So uh, my my next question is, what do you feel like is one of your greatest greatest successes in your career so far? We've kind of touched on a few, but I don't know if you have the one that stands out the most. Yeah. The, launching the jewelry business at J. Crew is pretty major. Just to see that kind of outsized growth and be able to keep yeah. up with it and be really innovative on how to get more, how to find new um, sources in that thing. I would say at, at, at Warby Parker, um, two years ago, I kept honing in on this idea. We have these best-selling styles that are working really well, but how do we make them you know, more accessible to a broader range of, of face fits? And so we worked really closely with our data science team and did a whole, we, we took um, 9,000 faces and studied the different metrics of ear to eye, bridge width, bridge height, um, what we call pupillary distance, the, the space between your two pupils, and launched what we call now extended sizing, but took our best sellers and it introduced oh. kind of for the first time in the glasses world, like sizing. So we we have some of our best selling frames, like for example, um, this frame comes in four sizes. So you can get it in extra narrow all the way to extra wide. But this idea of like, hey, we have a product that works really well. How do we make it fit more than, instead of trying to design a new frame for every single fit and every single face? And yeah. I think it also from a branding perspective, if, you, if we are known for a subset of frames, I think there's certain frames that people might say those look like Warby Parker. How do we allow more people to experience those? And it's been really, really successful um, and kind of at wow. the forefront. So that was my baby for a long time. And it was fun to kind of see it come to fruition and be on the shelves. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Um, so you've hired many employees over the years and you just you mentioned that you have a team of 29 right now. What do you feel like are important qualities um, in hiring, finding that strong hire? Yeah, communication skills are huge, right? I really, you know, for me, if I can make that connection and I feel like within the first couple of minutes, I can get a sense of how they would be communicating either with their team or with their manager. So that's a big piece of that. And that includes writing skills, presentation skills, just how you present yourself. I also am always very impressed by the 
the curiosity that a candidate shows. So they've done the research on the brand. They come to me with very specific questions that show that they would be sort of a self-starter, that they would think about not just this is the sales, but because these are the sales, what's the connecting of the dots to ask these questions and what might that lead to? So Warby Parker really values people who are self-starters, who can kind of roll up their sleeves and go beyond just what's being asked of them. And so I always feel like when people come to an interview prepared and say, hey, I was in your store and I noticed this, or for example, we have a home try-on program where we send five frames to your house. I love when someone I interview has gone through the home try-on process and says, oh, I had the frames come to my house. Here was my experience. I chose these frames. Here was what I saw on the website or I went into your store. And so that kind of preparedness or curiosity to me is very typically emblematic of what kind of employee they would be down the road. And then a good listener, I always find sometimes I'm in interviews and before I get the question all the way out, someone's trying to, to answer it. And I, I love the eager and earnest nature, but I think the best way to kind of really collaborate and show that you're um, going to be good at what you say you're going to be good at is that you can listen first and really absorb before you answer. Great. I love that. I love all three of those. <laughs> um, so a flip side of that question, what, what do you think makes a great leader? So yeah, the, uh, my two CEOs right now, which is kind of interesting to have co-CEOs. I've never worked with that before, and they complement each other really well. But I think one of the things that makes them really, really good at what they do is they're very aware of what they don't know, and they're very okay with that. So there's not this hubris or pride that gets in the way of being good decisions being made. They give the people on their team a lot of rope. I mean, I always say I'm only as successful as my team. And I think they really believe that too. They understand that they're hiring in areas of expertise because they can't do everything and be the eyes everywhere and know every last piece. So a good leader is really collaborative. It, they take the time to absorb all the different perspectives. And it's like their their decision is informed because they they pulled from all the different areas of the business versus being kind of that autocratic, this is my, this is what I think, or just putting in a perspective just because they're the boss, right? I, I work for two men now that are very much like, Kim, you know far more about the product than I do. So come to us with your recommendations. Um, and I think they're also very solution oriented. So it's like, I don't want to hear what's not working. I want to hear what's not working and how you're going to fix it. And I think putting that accountability into the, the hands of your team also has, I, I feel more bought into this company than I've ever felt with any other. I think they, they figured out how to teach that passion and pride in the company, but also that level of accountability. Yeah. That's great. Um, See how how difficult is it to maintain brand integrity integrity when you're trying to hit a price point? I Obviously, actually would argue a little bit more value conscious. <laughs> yeah, I would argue that it's not that difficult if you really defined what your brand is, right? We always say, "What's your value proposition?" And as long as you can clearly define what your value proposition is and stick to it, and and are are pretty um, strict about not going outside of those brand parameters then it, it makes it easier to make decisions about how you want, where you want to spend, how you want your brand to be perceived. You know, and we have a really strict code of what types of font, our color palette, like all of that is, the idea for us is always, we want you to recognize Warby before you even read the name, right? Without being in your face, we're not a logo driven company. And we want it also to feel approachable and attainable, but to be understandable. We know what Warby Parker brings and what the value is there. And I think if you define that from the outset and are pretty strict about staying within those parameters or guidelines you've set for yourself, and, you know, it, it requires discipline for sure because there's been moments where people say like, oh, don't you want to be a lifestyle brand? You guys should go into this. You guys should go into this. And it's like we have so much work to do within this space and we've identified the opportunity here. We have to be disciplined about what our value proposition is and where we think we can really bring value to the customer but also to the business. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I had um, I had to see one of the co-founders of Bombas in last last semester and that was one of the big things that he was talking about was like when you're an expert in one thing you know you have to be really cautious about dabbling in something new yeah. because you can blow yourself up quickly. you don't want to confuse the customer and i think customers really value expertise right now more so and also i mean the brands are so much easier it's so much easier to have your story get lost right there's so many more touch points to customers than there used to be and there's a lot more commentary right like we've all seen you put something out on instagram or facebook or any of those channels customers are a lot more vocal and uh to the negative sometimes so it's just really sticking to what you know and what you've clearly defined from the outset protects you a little bit too i would say yeah definitely
Um, where's your favorite place to shop and why? Oh, my, my most like nostalgic favorite place is the Bon Marché in Paris. I mean, I lived there when I was in college and there's something very magical and whimsical about that store. But also as a merchant, I love the way they've created similar to Ikea. They kind of force you to go through and explore. And, and I, I like that feeling. It's also a very open space. So they've done they have really high ceilings there. You can tell that um, their visual merchants have really thought about color stories. So your eye kind of gradually knows where to go and absorb it all in. But as a consumer who is too informed, so a lot of stores annoy me, <laughs> this one is one that still brings me a lot of joy. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Especially yeah. in the world of kind of dying department stores, right, where I think a lot of that, we're moving away from that in so many ways. I still appreciate the, the time and care and effort they put into the visual presentation. Yeah, definitely. Well, one of my big themes that I've um, been talking about with students this semester is um, sustainability. And yep. I'm just wondering if there's anything that Warby has been doing along those lines. Yeah, we have like, we have four kind of cornerstones that we're working on for sustainability. And, and, and one of them is, so when we ship a pair of glasses from our um, vendors to our different labs, we have to pop the, what we call demo lenses out and then fulfill them with prescriptions. So all those demo lenses just get thrown away. So we've been working really closely with two different manufacturers to see if we could actually make the demo lenses out of corn or a couple of other things. Corn sounds crazy, but it, and we're just trying to get the color to be a place um, that would be acceptable. So then we can send them back and kind of have this 360 where yeah. we take the demo lenses, box them up and send them back as opposed to just throwing them away and they're not recyclable. So that's that's one piece. The other is all of our damaged frames. There is a company called TerraCycle, and they will actually, instead of just throwing away the damaged frames, TerraCycle comes, and you, you pay a premium. I think that's the one thing that we need to figure out sort of on the global scale is in the same way I liken it to like 15 years ago when organic food was so much more expensive than non-organic food that it was like there was a barrier to entry. I think there is being sustainable is more expensive and that's the tough part. We have the ability to do that and we've baked it into some of our models, but I think I think it's the customer has to know it will take time because it is more expensive. But so TerraCycle takes the glasses and, and, it, and completely recycles them. So we hold all the glasses at a storage facility and then every quarter they come and take all of our damages and recycle those frames. And we're now looking at our home try-on box and we have like six samples that actually arrived at my head of product development last week and working with um, fully recyclable cardboard and the, these um, home try-on boxes. So those are kind of the three of the main. The last piece is our acetate. Um, we work with a company called Mazzucchelli who's um, centuries old out of Italy and we're working with them to see if there's a way to have the acetate acetate production process, which is very old. I mean, you would walk into this factory and think you were in like 1870 um, to be more sustainable in terms of air quality and air filtration. And so those are kind of some of the things that my team has been working on this year specifically around that. That's great though. I mean, that's a lot of big steps. And I think um, actually just yesterday, the business of fashion came out with their 2021 uh, state of the business. And I feel like sustainability is still very top of there. It was, <laughs> it was for 2020. And I think what you'll read is that a lot of people had to take a step back to really respond to the crisis that was happening. And so sustainability is going to have to jump back up to the top. I also think yeah. the change in administration will allow for kind of more um, open discussion about um, yeah, sort of the environment hope. and sustainability. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, there's hope. It's, yeah. it's got to get better, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, well, I think I guess I'll just end with one last question. What piece of advice would you have for someone who's just entering the industry right now, whether it's in women's wear, footwear, accessories? Stay informed and know that the customer will tell you almost all that you need to know. So if there's ways for you to connect with your customer, ask them questions. We do a ton of consumer surveys and insights because if you can build a brand that the customer sees the value in, they'll come back. And right now it's not only about acquiring a customer, it's about getting, giving them a reason to come back to you because brand loyalty in this day and age where everyone has so much information access to that, you want to build something that's memorable, give them an excellent customer experience, show them that you're at the forefront of kind of all that they do and all, all the, the decisions that you're making, I would say. And stay passionate and excited because this industry, I think, is one that's always been fueled by creativity, excitement, um, and the consumer is now like more important than ever. Great, thank you. Of course. Um, with that, I have, I'm sure the students have tons of questions. If you guys wanna raise your hands, I will call on you in order that we raise them. Raquel, you're first. Hello, my camera's just turning on, just a moment. 
Hello. Hi, Raquel. So much for coming. I found this to be so insightful. Um, of I really course. I appreciate you coming in. And um, something that I had on my mind because I've, I've read about your history before and something that stuck out to me was um, what well, was constantly being repeated was this quote. And you said, like, you know, you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take. Um, and so I was just wondering for, for someone like students like us who kind of want to go into the same field of what you do. Um, what can we do to be more prepared to take those shots and like what characteristics would you say were needed to kind of follow through with that? First and foremost, I would say inform yourself. If you can arm yourself with information about whether it's the company that you're most interested in. One of the things that I did at the very outset is what are the companies that most inspire me on that list? How can I go through every LinkedIn profile to see, is there someone that's a second or third connection, but really understanding what it is that you like and that you're good at and, and how to find a pathway there. Because it's one thing to say over here and say, I want this. It's another to say, what are the steps that I can take today to get myself closer to that piece of thing? So, the more you can hone in on, okay, I love working with people. I love working with product. I, I want to have a piece of the business and I want to be in an industry that is focused on product. Okay. And then what, what are those that inspire me? I think Bombas is, is like, it sucks, but man, they've really grown. And I, I see in a couple of things in that, or, you know, I, I like the commodity business and Harry's is an interesting model. that's like gone into fit feminine products and they're doing something different. But I think really asking yourself the questions, what inspires me, but then really being as, as precise as possible about those companies. And I, oh, whenever someone asks me a price, start with what inspires you, right? And then from there, typically there's at least four or five degrees of separation to almost all of them. And then don't be afraid to ask for help. I can't tell you how many people from the Dartmouth network reach out to me on LinkedIn and say, I'm a, you know, I'm graduating this year and it's a really tough year. Do you have any advice for me? Or I'm really interested in this company. Do you know anyone who works there? And I give them so much credit because they're utilizing the resources, whatever they look like like and trying to just figure out how to take the next step forward and sometimes it's it's making the steps much smaller versus that big step how do I get all the way to here what's the next step to get me down that path and usually what a mentor or someone will say is what is it that you really want and is it I want to be in meetings all day I want to travel I want to develop something I want someone you know I'm really interested in digital marketing I think there's this beautiful blend of creative but really analytical piece whatever that may be and honestly surf LinkedIn because there's job descriptions you don't even know exist I always I say to everyone I didn't know half of these jobs existed when I was in college I really didn't so even just thinking about okay if I'm going to go on a company's you know website what are all the different job listings that are there what are the ones that I could potentially, and, and there's, and I think even half the time of the jobs that we write descriptions for, we're making them up as we go along based on the needs of the business. So in that same, if you flip that around and say like, okay, I can kind of craft what I like and or what I'm good at to fit that job description. If that makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah. Of course. Very, I don't, I didn't really think about, you know, people are making the job position to what's needed. It, it's, yeah. It's obvious. There's, something you don't think about there's no playbook right so I think yeah. it's more like okay these are the three areas of priority for my team right now like one of them we literally wrote a job description yesterday and I was like I don't even know how we're gonna find this person but we're gonna have to pick and choose what are the what are the characteristics and most of it's gonna be are they self-starred are they willing to roll up their sleeves and write this job description with us in real time you know we they don't need a ton of experience but they're gonna to have to be a good communicator they're gonna to have to be excited about presentations and they're gonna to have to want to learn the contact lens business you know <laughs> and like and then we'll go from there. So, awesome. Well, thank you so much again. Of course. Um, great, Evangelos. I have you next. Hi, Kim. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Great. My question is: Do you know? Uh, how do you know when um, you're? Oh, you're leaving me in suspense. I wasn't sure if that was me. I was sitting there wondering. Um, looks like he's reconnecting right now. We lost um, you for a bit uh, there. I don't know if you want to start again. Yeah, yeah. So how do you and your team decide on the best strategy to use? Is there a majority vote? I think it depends, honestly, on which strategy and what it pertains to. So, for example, with like um, when we're debating how many collections to launch and which what should what should that look like, right? So we typically mm -hmm. launch 16 to 20 collections in a year, and we've over time. So we kind of look back at 
previous selling and see that there's certain times of the year where more expensive glasses sell mm -hmm. or lighter weight glasses sell, right? So in the summer, metal tends to sell not quite as well as sort right. of the, we call it the back to school trend. And then in, in December, we noticed that $95 sunglasses and $95 glasses sell better because I think, A, they fit within our gift card denomination and also they're, they're a better gift price point. So we kind of use all of that, but then really, we're, I task people that own the business to come to me and say, my recommendation is such, and then I'll ask a ton of questions and allow the team, kind of the planning team, and the product development team to ask questions to make sure that we feel like this decision has is one that's informed, but really try to give my team ownership over that piece. And as long as I feel like they've come with, you know, the right information and done the work, then I, I like to give ownership, especially over certain decisions like that. Interesting. Thank you. Of course. Kim, you just made me think of a question. I'm wondering how much your business is replenishment based and how much your business is fashion? A lot of replenishment, right? Especially on the optical side of things. So the optical trend cycle is a lot longer. And I think the biggest difference between the two is, is glasses, while they're becoming more of a fashion statement, for a lot of people, they're a medical device, right? So and you're wearing them on your face and you can see your eyes through them. So it's a big decision about how it kind of integrates with your look. And I think we're seeing the younger generation take more risks with wearing oversized frames or, or that kind of thing, especially in this virtual culture, we're seeing even more of that. So there's a lot of replenishment. So we'll have some people buy the same pair of glasses six or seven times because it works for them. It's become part of their face. Whereas sunglasses, the trend is oversized. And you know, depending on what you know Kylie Jenner is wearing next, we've got awkward shapes and heart shapes and oversized shapes. And so we have to blend there with how much do we want to go after that trend and how much do we want to stick to kind of the core you know style that we know sells for Warby Parker. We also have a big prescription sunglass business. That's also a different customer because it's a bigger investment and they're same thing. They're wearing them for a purpose other than just kind of aesthetics. Yeah. What what part of your business, what part of your sunglass business is prescription and what part is a much larger percent is prescription. Yeah, the oh, non-prescription yeah. is a much smaller percentage because I just don't, I don't personally believe that we we compete in that space as much. The, the non-prescription business, there's either like the really cheap and cheerful or the sort of more expensive logo-driven sunglasses. And often we find the luxury logo-driven sunglasses, that's people's step-up purchase. So while they may not have a piece of Chanel on them, they want to make sure that you see it on their on their glasses to kind of get credit for that piece. So it's a, the non-prescription and our, our, our stores are much more optimized to sell prescription. That's what our associates yeah. are trained in. We have eye doctors in our store. So this has been sort of an add-on business. And we typically see people coming in to shop with someone else who's looking for glasses and they'll pick up a pair, a pair here or there, but it's a much smaller percentage. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's interesting that you say that my, my husband, neither my husband nor I wear glasses. So I've never really frequented um, Warby Parker, but in conversations with Kyle, he's like, you know, you got to check out sunglasses. And, um, you know, it just, it hadn't occurred to me to go look, yeah. but then I see and we haven't that targeted shirt. that customer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 We often find people like, I didn't know you sold non-prescription sunglasses. And I always laugh because it's like, well, any pair of sunglasses can be made prescription or non-prescription, but we haven't really spent time targeting that customer or marketing to them specifically. Right. Because are you going to walk into like optic wear in the mall to buy your sunglasses? No. If you don't yeah, do exactly. <laughs> so it's, a, exactly. it's definitely a shift in mentality. Um, Leoletta, I have you next. Hi. Um, thank you so Hi, much. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you so much for being here today. I have to say, I love Warby Parker. Like, I got, these are the Darren ones right now. <laughs> Which are, or I was just going to comment, I think you're wearing the Darren and they're selling very well. <laughs> they're my favorite. Like, I legitimately got them. I asked for them for Christmas last year because my last ones were just, I found personally very hideous. So these are our step up. <laughs> well, they look great and they fit you perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> Well, now for my question. Are you, are you out of the country, or are you originally out of the country as well, or did you get them here in the States? I got um, them at Grand Central in New York, actually. Oh, okay. Which okay. also, experience-wise, was very nice. <laughs> that's good. That has, that, that's one of our highest customer experience stores, which you, it's always interesting because it's Grand Central, so it's like a rotating customer. People are usually very time-sensitive. They're trying to catch their train or stuff, but we get really high marks there, so I love that you said that. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I walked in maybe like three or four times before I actually was sold on this because it was either between this or the Avas. And I was like, nah, this, this is, and I got the tortoise shell. Those are just right, especially Thank with you. your eyebrows. They really <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> um, but my question is, is like when you're about to release a new like line of glasses, um, what, 
is like what's your process of going about merchandising them and is there like a certain like like company parameters that you try to follow so that way it's within brand yeah so we have a, a whole creative department and and that's really where i was talking about those branding guidelines come into play there's de definitely we have sort of core collections we just launched our winter core and those are very much within those warby brand in terms of wardrobe and setting and then we do these capsule collections which are a little bit more fashion forward we launch one tomorrow it's super cool from italy and it's our last collection of the year and that one we might step out a little bit more or just you know choose whether we're going to do on figure or um still life and this one they're made in italy and there's a really cool Windsor rim type concept. So we have the super up close shots in that sense. And then really what works for us is this combination in all of our stores, uh, our, our merchants make sure that our new arrivals bay is in the most profitable bay, which actually isn't the first bay, but it's usually the second or third bay in, and it's the diagonal to the right. of when you walk into a store, most people tend to go to their right first. So we kind of put the new arrivals to the right and sort of at the diagonal from the door. Um, little weird little tricks like that that we've seen over time work with based on our heat sensitivity maps. And then we send emails and, and right now, email is a huge part of getting that out so we have really high open rates on our new collection um, launch emails and then from a gallery perspective our e-commerce merchants figure out you know our top three or four rows are obviously super valuable so how do we pepper in um, where those new arrivals sit how do we tag them and make sure customers know about that piece and then usually we, we partner with our social media team and make sure that it's on Instagram or there's a Facebook ad that's associated with that piece of things and then and then buy certain search terms around either the name of the collection or certain trends if green acetate or blue acetate or metal is trending. So it's really this super collaborative effort with our branding team, our email marketing team, our e-commerce team, and our retail team to make sure, okay, here's the new products coming out. Here are all the touch points from the customer. How do we, and then my team also writes all of the training. So making sure that all of our customer experience, like our call center and our retail sales associates know this is what the collection story is about. This is how we would hope that you would speak to it. These are the questions that might come of it, that kind of thing. So it's definitely, when that starts like four months before the collection launches. So we're constantly in some some segment of that cycle okay and um are you part of the design process for the glasses super close oh. to the design yeah how is that because i'm very curious because it's like so we do because you know, like, like warby parker is kind of like newer in the sense of like here's stylish glasses like let's feel yeah. cool kind of thing like how is that process i would have to so say. we we design all of our, our frames in-house which is what makes us a little bit unusual so they literally start with a sketch which isn't necessarily how all the different you know, eyeglass vendors or eyeglass manufacturers do it. So we, we and then we also, so saying before we design all the acetates, but a lot of it starts with, okay, um, you know, we, we bucket things into four attributes shape wise, kind of square, rectangular, um, round or oval, and then cat eye. And then within those talk about whether we want thin or thick. Um, and we use a lot of different um, decade inspiration. So we just did a whole collection like based on a couple of swipe from the seventies and talk a lot about like how severe the cat eye should be. So we, we use a lot of swipe and it's a, I mean, but it's, it starts 18 months before the collection launches and we go through sample iterations. Actually, you guys might find this interesting. Um, in the last eight months, we started using 3d printers. So my two, technical designers now have 3D printers in their bathroom at home because it's COVID. But so there was a frame shape that I saw out there and they just sent me and these are actually 3D printed. So, you know, it takes about five hours and it's just layer upon layer upon layer of plastic, but it allows us wow. to design and get this to market that much faster by 3D printing them. So that's been a really cool innovation. Is that functional that's amazing. though? Like they don't have no, we, them, but like, no, we wouldn't sell them. But what this does is just allow us to see, okay, do we like the shape? Do we feel like the fit of the nose pad sits in the right place? And, and it allows us, if we really want to speed this to market, to not wait those extra three or four months to get the sample. And we can put this in acetates that we feel confident in. So we wanted to get this for this coming summer because we've seen the shape out there and we're excited by it. We didn't have time to go through the whole process. So we 3D printed it and then we'll put it in black and crystal, which are kind of our, our true sellers. And then That's so go cool. from there. So that's, that's been a new innovation. Are they just like plastic that that, that prints? Yeah, they, yeah, they feel like a matted sort of like really lightweight plastic. They weigh like nothing. Very cool. But they're all of the design, technical design specifications are actually type, typed into the 3D printer. So they just layer by layer by layer get it out. It takes like less than a day. So it's pretty cool. They look wow. like the ones you're wearing. Awesome. Are they the same? They, <laughs> they're not exactly the same, but they're similar. Um, but yes, and they'll have a, a different rivet design and they're a little bit more squared off. I know nuances, things that we obsess yeah. over. <laughs> now awesome. I'm like, well, okay, are you going to have Gloria Steinem glasses coming out soon? <laughs> you know, she, she's, always out, she's always out there, right? Iris is out there. There's all those sort of iconic glasses wearers that we go back to in different ways. 
if we're joking, Joe Biden's wearing all these aviators. Like, is that gonna <laughs> is that gonna come back in a major way? <laughs> So, like, Al Roker's got like you glasses. mentioned the green. The blue so Al Roker has been wearing blue. Like <laughs> I know, and everyone's like, "Who frames are Al Roker's?" I was like, "Those are not ours. That is not our color scheme. <laughs> They're loud." <laughs> I know. Oprah takes a lot of our sunglasses and turns them into optical glasses. So she she takes a lot of our best selling optical our sunglasses because she likes them oversized or she likes the colors, and she'll call us and we'll fulfill them as optical frames, and she gets very excited. Wow, oh, that's great. <laughs> Super fun. Well, thank you so much for answering my question. Of course. Yes, Happy to. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Shay, I have you next. Hi, how are you? Hi, Shay. Hi. Um, so my question was, um, what skills from your professional career in finance were you able to transfer over into the fashion industry? So honestly, assessing a business, so something that we talk about a lot is KPIs, key performance indicators. So being able to quickly look at those, whether it's, you know, one that I look at often is how quickly is my inventory turning over, right? And just, you know, so the mathematical element of that, but also looking at a business and picking out the key things. So we look at inventory turns and we also manage what's called an open to buy. If we have this, this much inventory at the beginning of the month and we've sold through this much, how much how much do I now have open to buy more of? Um, so that's been another piece is just understand, and also understanding a balance sheet, right? So if I were starting a business today, I would understand kind of the, the key elements of a balance sheet and all of those I feel, because I did not take a ton of economics courses in college or math courses, I got like the, the four year tutorial in finance, sort of be able to, to marry sort of my passion for design and trend with the business sense to the business acumen to back it up so kind of mar the marriage of those two worlds has i think probably helped my career advance in that i could speak to the business piece while also very much connecting with the design teams of course um Brittany, you're next Hi. Hi. Hi, Brittany. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks for chatting today. It's really awesome to listen to all your information and experience. Of course. Really cool. I'm enjoying um, myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice to like interact with people. Um, so I wanted to know, like, since you were working for such big brands, I think you touched on this before, like J. Crew and Todd's, and those have been around for so long, and they're such old brands, and then. Warby Parker was started around, I think, 2010, right? Um, is there anything, how was that transition? Like, is there, like, I guess my question is, what do you prefer and what did you bring to it? And kind of like, what was the whole dynamic? Yeah, I mean, and they talk about three very different companies. So Todd's was like steeped in this very specific Italian tradition and they just didn't necessarily want our point of view even, right? They wanted us to do our job. And then J. Crew was sort of attempting to build something, but all of a sudden we were like trying to move a cruise ship versus like a little sunfish or a small boat kind of thing. So making changes took a long time and it was really hard to get everyone on board with, we were like really at an inflection point, like social media was just coming to the forefront, selling things online. And we, you know, at that time, merchandising was like rack them high and let them fly, like put them on the store and people will come to those malls and they'll buy your product. But like we didn't know how to pivot a strategy that was changing kind of before our eyes. So that was frustrating. It's honestly one of the reasons I left is like, I, I feel like the world is changing and we're not changing with it. And that's gonna be harder and harder to dig ourselves out of that. So, but, I also had access to a lot of resources. So when I was working at Take Crew, I had a big team, I had access to systems, I had access to budget, I could, so there was a lot of things that I had that were, I would say more luxurious, right? I could say, oh, someone needs to book this conference room or book my travel or this kind of thing. And when I got over to Warby Parker, we were much more scrappy, right? So it was like, oh, I have to roll my sleeves up. And it's like, okay, we need to do this. Oh, and I need to do that because there's no one else here to do it. And so I mean, when I started, my team was five people and we've now grown quite a bit over the last five years. 
but there's something super rewarding and fulfilling if you have the appetite to kind of get in on something that's still very much in the growth phase to watch it happen in real time and to, to be part of every decision that's coming into the forefront and to, to be making the decisions that you can see the change happening versus spending half your time trying to convince people that change needs to happen before change even is on the docket to happen. So there's a pace um, at Warby Parker that I prefer just for my personality in general, but also I think the level of accountability that I can give to my team and talk to them about these decisions that we're making are massively impacting the business and you're gonna see it tomorrow because it's gonna go up on the website for the first time or that kind of thing. So I think the level, just that much being that much closer to the business as it's evolving and changing and being part of that strategy, was for me really fulfilling and exciting, um, but nerve wracking and stressful. I, I always say to my husband, like my brand, my brain has been more stressed, but more expanded, expansive in the last five years working here. And it makes me feel like I could go anywhere and, and do anything because we've kind of seen every last element of it, which, and I think if you asked me seven or eight years ago, if I would ever be excited about glasses, I probably would have said no, right? Like I like luxury, I like clothing, I'm into handbags and I like product. But I kind of what I realized probably over these last five or six years is that if you care about the business model and you and then it doesn't matter what you're selling, right? If you believe in what the business model is and you believe that you can enact change, then you'll get excited about the product. Thank you. Thanks so much. Of course. Um, then Rita, I have you next. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can see me. I just we can't. Hi. Um, thank you so much for coming in. Um, I'm very inspired by your career and the roles that you've done throughout. And my question is regarding that. Um, it's sort of all over the place, but I was wondering, um, what were the challenges that you faced uh, when you entered the fashion industry? after building a whole career in um, finance? I mean, a lot, basically, because I have really had to prove myself and sort of start all over, even though I'd had a, a career of almost five years, people sort of, uh, especially in Todd's, which was an old kind of um, luxury house that had very specific definitions and standards of what people, what box you were kind of supposed to fit into. So they kept saying, are you sure you don't want to be a store planner? And I'd say, no, I, I'm here to be in fashion. This is what I want to do. And I, I made this decision. And so I, I did have to prove myself and prove that like my previous experience wasn't going to define my future. Um, and then also sort of, um, especially when I got to Warby Parker, I didn't have traditional merchandising experience at all. And, and that was another one where a lot of people were hired directly out of college and grew up through the ranks, but maybe had never worked anywhere else. So I really had to figure out how to carve a story and show what my value proposition was, is that I had this other experience that allowed me to maybe be more informed about certain aspects of the business. And, and then I, I worked really hard. I mean, I, I, I made a concerted effort to read everything I could get my hands on and to make sure that if there were any questions that came up about trend or what was happening, that I had a, a point of view. I would always say to my team, if, if the CEO stops by your desk, there should always be three things about your business that you can tell them, right? So, hey, belts were selling really well today. This is the number one style, and we're super excited about this new scarf that came in or, or whatever it may be, but always feeling like I can sum up anyone who asks me about what's happening in my business or what's happening in the fashion world. I have at least three things to discuss. And I think, you know, um, Mickey, who was the CEO at the time, would say, your team's always so prepared for me, and that was such a big compliment, but it was because you have to start, I think I was answering this in a different question, but a similar way. You have to start small and say, well, these are the steps that I can take tomorrow to change what I'm doing today and make myself better versus saying, I want to be the president first, right? It's like, what are the little steps? And so learning how to tell your story, learning how to really take what you're seeing in your business and being able to communicate that out are, are super important. And that was those, that was my focus at the time to kind of prove myself, I guess. Thank you. That was very helpful. Thank you for coming today. Of course. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's great advice. I like that. <laughs> Bridget, you're next. Uh, hi. I was just curious. When you're um, trying to be sustainable, how do you keep your prices so reasonable? One thing I love about Warby Parker is that, you know, you have, like, very nice and trendy glasses, but they're still, you know, very approachable prices. 
So one of the things as we've started to focus on sustainability, is I, I put that in my annual budget and I kind of just give myself a buffer to say, you know what, my packaging may go up by X percent as I explore this. And I'm, I'm conservative to live myself room to play around with that and, and put that in. We have an operating plan and I kind of have to present the top 10 things that my team has focused on. And for the last four years, sustainability has always been on there. But I always talk about how it will come at a cost. Luckily, though, one of the things that we've been pretty fortunate is our business has scaled quite quite quickly. And so I'm able to use that to negotiate and sort of leverage with some of our partners. Hey, we've grown with you 20, 30, 40% over the last five years. Sustainability is really important to us. If you want to continue to see that growth and be a partner with us, you have to also invest in sustainability on your manufacturing side of things. So, so making sure that it's a partnership and it's not just us paying for it, but our vendors knowing that it's something that's part of the core value of, of where we partner too. So making sure that it's a really a 360 conversation and that people know when you're working with us, this is something that we're going to continue to ask for. Same way when we, any of our vendors, we make sure that their human resources department is completely up and running and we have a whole vendor manual that they have to show, show, prove to us that they're a viable operation, that human rights is important to them, that sustainability, environmental, all those things have to be checked before we would ever even walk through the door. So I think also putting that out at the forefront is this is part of the ethos of who we are if you want to work with us. Okay, thank you so much. Of course, thank you. Great, do we have any other questions? Oh, well, such Ken, great questions. You. I really appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> yes, well, thanks for being here. This was wonderful and um, hope you have a happy and healthy holiday yeah, season. Same and to all of you. Good luck with everything. It's a cool industry. If there's any anything I can do, please let me know. I'm happy to be a part of it. Great questions, great engagement. I really appreciated it. Great, thank you. All right. Bye. Um, students, I have I have your end of class attendance question. And I look forward to hearing from you. I always like to ask this every semester. What speaker or type of speakers would you like to see on the spring 2021 lineup for Faces and Places? As you know, this is open to the public. So I always um, would welcome you back, whether we're in person or remote, although spring 21 will be remote. Um, so, I will take your advice to heart and go out and seek said speaker or speakers, type of speakers, um, and I look forward to hearing your answers. Any other questions about anything else? Please let me know. <laughs>